Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Maritime History Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Hubner, and today we have episode 13, Akrotiri, Atlantis, and the Thera Eruption. As the title might suggest, today we're going to look in a bit more detail at the exquisite wall paintings from Akrotiri. The volcanic eruption that buried Akrotiri destroyed much of Thera and effected large swaths of the Bronze Age Aegean, and then we'll finish up by tossing around some of the major perspectives on whether or not the Minoan people were the historical basis for the Atlantis legend, and whether the Thera eruption was the cataclysmic event that marked the end of the Minoan hegemony in the Aegean. First, a few announcements, if you don't mind. The winner of our recent book giveaway for a copy of the illustrated edition of Wreck of the Whaleship Essex was none other than Mark Sands, a listener of the podcast since fairly early on. Congratulations, Mark, and thanks for the support. Speaking of my gratitude for listener support, I did also want to thank Brenda and Russell for their recent donations. Support from listeners like Brenda and Russell has helped finance the file hosting and website expenses for the podcast, and it's allowed me to get a hold of a few good research materials, too. And I greatly appreciate each and every donation. I'm also grateful for those of you who've supported us by leaving reviews on iTunes. So a big thank you for the recent reviews from Jarbo Kamen, Brian Hawkeye, Pops and Lynn, Josh from Cape May, Lynn Spook, Fan of History, Brego24601, and last but not least, Gary Home Ed. Thanks so much for the reviews, everybody. I really enjoy hearing from listeners, and I'd love to get somewhat of a community going to foster discussion of maritime history topics, from whatever era or location they might be. With that in mind, I went ahead and created a Facebook group for the podcast. Facebook's algorithms and whatnot are exceedingly frustrating to me, and I know to a lot of other people who run Facebook pages. So even though I posted an announcement about the group, good old Facebook didn't really feel like showing it to anybody who's liked our page. A group on Facebook would allow members to see every post if they wanted, every update, and even allow members to post news of their own subject to moderation, of course. So if you're interested, you can just search for the Maritime History Podcast group on Facebook to join those of us already there. It would be awesome to see each and every one of you hop aboard. I look forward to it. My last item before diving into our discussion for today is to announce another book giveaway. I'm just as excited for this one as I was for our last one. And although the book deals with maritime history, it's quite a bit different than The Wreck of the Whale Ship Essex. This time around, I've got a copy of Pirate Hunters, Treasure, Obsession, and the Search for a Legendary Pirate Ship. This book was written by Robert Curzon, author of the best-selling book Shadow Divers, which was about the discovery of a German U-boat 60 miles off the coast of New Jersey and the years-long quest to identify the wreck. The book that I'm giving away, though, is called Pirate Hunters, and it focuses on two men as they go on a quest to discover the lost shipwreck of one of piracy's most underrated captains, a merchant-turned-pirate during the Golden Age of Piracy, Joseph Bannister. His ship, the Golden Fleece, was sunk off the coast of the Dominican Republic in 1686, during Bannister's showdown with the Royal Navy, a battle and a story that is wonderfully recounted in the book. The location of the ship was lost to time, and other portions of the book give a decent overview of piracy during the period, along with Bannister's life story. It also includes the life stories of the two men who mounted a search for his lost ship over 300 years later. One of those men is John Chatterton, a world-famous diver who was also the subject of Shadow Divers. His story, and the story of his partner, John Matera, 
make Pirate Hunters a great book that examines not only piracy and the stories of Joseph Bannister and his hunt and his eventual capture by the Royal Navy, but it also includes stories about shipwreck hunting and the dedication and work that divers and wreck hunters put into pursuing the wrecks that continue to elude us today. The giveaway for Pirate Hunters will work much like the last giveaway did. It's going to run for four weeks. It technically began on June 20th, and I'll leave it open until July 18th. That's the last day for entry. Like last time, entry is fairly simple. If you've reviewed the podcast before, even if you entered the last giveaway and didn't win, just notify me of your desire to enter this giveaway so that I can contact you should you win. If you haven't reviewed the podcast before, but you're able to, reviews are much appreciated. They're great. Just let me know your username via email or social media message, and I'll get you entered. If you can't review the podcast or you'd prefer not to, no problem. Just tell a friend about the podcast, and then let me know that you want to be entered in the giveaway as well. You're good to go. Sadly, I have to again limit the scope of the giveaway to those with a mailing address in the United States or Canada, just because of the fact that shipping internationally from the U.S. is pretty pricey. Many apologies to everyone outside the scope of the giveaway. I wish I could include all of you, and maybe I will be able to sometime in the future, but right now I just can't afford it. I'll post details on our website and links to more info about the book on our show notes for today's episode. So if you don't happen to be our winner, but you're interested in purchasing your own copy, I'm sure that there are copies at your local bookstore. Amazon also has the book available, and I'll link to it there as well, but it should be available everywhere, as it was just released this past week. Please spread the news about the giveaway, if you'd be so kind as I'd love to get as many people involved as possible. Thank you so much. All right, now we're finally down to our material for today. When we concluded last time, we'd just barely brushed the surface of our discussion about the island of Thera, or Santorini as it's now called. Thera measures in at a scant 28 square kilometers, which is microscopic in comparison to Crete, which measures 8,300 square kilometers. But, despite Thera's diminutive size, it will play a large role in our episode today, and it's a pretty fitting picture of the events that fell on the Minoans round about the year 1600 BCE. Before we zoom out to look at the island itself and some of the big picture issues and events, we'll begin with our focus trained in on one specific room in one specific building, in one specific village on the island of Thera. The village is Akrotiri, or that's the name of the modern Greek village that sits on a hill near the Bronze Age village anyway. The village we're focused on is a Bronze Age Minoan settlement that sits on the coast of Thera, as it did in the 17th century BCE. The building we're focused on is known as the West House, and our room in question is on the building's second story, a room known to archaeologists as Room 5. Had any of us had the privilege of entering Room 5 around, say, 1650 BCE, we may have chanced to see some artists at work painting the room's beautiful frescoes. It's also just as likely that the paintings had already been completed by that time. But either way, our focus would have been drawn to one particular fresco that tells an intriguing story. It would have wrapped around three of the room's four walls, a continuous 39-foot, 12-meter fresco. And in contrast to its length, it would have only been about a foot and a half tall, about 43 centimeters. Now, before we start to talk about the content of the painting itself, the Akrotiri fleet fresco, we'll call it, I think it's necessary to give a short background of the discovery and the context of the fresco first. The West House, also known as the Admiral's House, 
was excavated by a Greek archaeologist named Spiridon Maranatos over the course of the 1971-72 to digging seasons on Thera. When he got to room 5, which was buried under meters of pumice and ash, a situation that we'll take a look at a bit later on today, the upper parts of the second story walls were collapsed. This was a bit of a problem, as you could imagine, because the fleet fresco was painted along the upper part of those very walls. Well, it was painstaking work, but the wall pieces had collapsed inward, so the fresco was still there, albeit in a fragmented state. The images of the fresco that are now famous are images of the reconstructed entirety of the painting. So it's important to at least keep in the back of our minds that we don't have the entire original. There are gaps from what Maranatos found that were filled in after they were discovered. So this will influence how we interpret the paintings and what they were intended to depict by the original Minoan painters. That all being said, the paintings are marvelous no matter what, and they provide us with some interesting points to discuss in relation to Minoan maritime capabilities and practices. As usual, I'll be sure to post pictures of the fleet fresco on the website if you want to get a visual look at just what it is we're talking about, but I'll do my best to describe the high points. On either extreme end of the fresco sits a separate town, each one situated amidst the mountainous shorelines that are common to Cycladic islands. In the town on the left, the people stand stationary, eyes turn toward the sea as they follow the departing fleet that sails for the horizon. In the town on the right end of the painting, the townspeople look in the opposite direction, toward the same sea, but back toward the arriving fleet of Minoan ships. It was this second town that had suffered more damage when the fresco was originally recovered. But even in the fragmentary image that existed before restoration, a few of the townspeople seemed to be in motion, rushing to the harbor to welcome the arriving fleet. Others in the harbor town simply go about their business, returning from the shore to bring their day's catch of fish to the market. Beyond the human inhabitants of the two towns, the fresco also depicts wildlife. On a mountaintop above the first town, a lion chases three deer amidst the trees. And in the sea between our two unnamed towns, pairs of dolphins playfully leap from the water in between the sailing ships. It's a striking fresco, I'm sure even more striking in person. But let's go ahead and point our discussion toward the ships that are depicted in the painting, as they give us our best insight thus far into the nautical technology that was used by the Minoans at this late point in their history. Although similar ships had probably been used for centuries before their depiction was set down in pigment. In all, the painting depicts 11 separate ships, although one is small enough, it's technically a boat, I suppose. The ship leaving the port of the first town is smaller than the ships in the sea, as are the two ships that appear to be docked in harbor at the second town. So this lone small boat could also have been depicted smaller simply for the purpose of depicting its relative nearness to the town, as it's the nearest vessel to arriving at town number two's harbor. All of the ships are of a similar shape, being constructed with long, graceful hulls that curve into bows that stretch above the masts of each ship. All of the ships are single-masted, with the mast located amidships, but only one ship has a sail unfurled and handled by a pair of sailors. Steering on these ships was accomplished via a pair of quarter rudders at the stern quarters of the hull. So, essentially, all of these ships are identical in their main functional construction. The apparent difference between them comes in the realm of decoration instead. In that realm of decor, the ships again bear some common traits. 
Each one has a small structure near the stern that appears to serve as a small cabin for one person. The obvious assumption being that this is a single cabin for the captain or shipmaster alone. In addition to the small cabin, the ships also have, further forward, a canopy-like structure that occupies almost half the overall length of the ship. Beneath this canopy on each ship sit between 10 to 15 people who appear to be dressed in formal attire. The ships also have steersmen and crew, but one aspect common to all the ships save one is the colorful decor that ornaments the ships themselves. They have animal figureheads at the stern, a maritime practice that's still common today. And the hulls are colorfully decorated, while one particular ship, called the flagship by some, has lines rigged from fore to aft, decorated with colorful garland-like trimming. These decorations are the dividing factor in some of the interpretations that have been proposed for the significance of the event that's depicted in the fresco. And I must warn you, the various proposals are quite divergent. A common interpretation has centered on the fleet as possibly representing a religious or cultic procession, maybe due to the decoration and the relative inaction of the ship's passengers. Other scholars have interpreted the scene as being a celebration of good relations between Cretans and Achaeans. Still more have seen it as depicting Minoan ships returning to harbor after a naval triumph. And even more beyond that, think that it perhaps shows the return of a fleet after a peaceful mission abroad. Ultimately, we aren't possessed of enough context or evidence to know for sure what the Minoan painters intended to depict. It does still present us with an excellent example of their artistry, and it gives us perhaps the most concrete example of Minoan ships at sail. Although we must interpret the ships through the artist's perception of them, as the artistic eye doesn't always opt for realism over beauty artistic license and all that, you know. It's also worth mentioning, connected to the fleet fresco, that in room 5 in Akrotiri, archaeologists discovered another fresco that appears to have contained the depiction of at least one other ship. The second fresco, sadly, was poorly preserved, and much of it has been lost. It's even more so a shame because the pieces that we do have seem to indicate that the ship was similar to those of the fleet fresco, in form at least. This ship is similar in the fact that it looks to be under oar propulsion, but for some reason the ship bears a spearman toward the forward of the ship. Beneath him in the water, contorted bodies writhe beneath the waves. The fragmentation of this fresco has made interpretation a bit more challenging. And again, various proposals have been put forward. An attack on a coastal town, where defenders have been killed and drowned. Possibly a sea battle. Or some have even thought that the bodies aren't dead at all, but are rather sponge divers at work in the waters near the shore. When it's all said and done, Opinions still diverge on what both of these frescoes depict, and even on whether they were intended to depict a single narrative, or instead separate events. As I said a moment ago, though, they show us Minoan artistry at its height, in addition to giving us further evidence of their maritime prowess. Were it not for the next major event in the Minoan world, the fleet fresco and the other lovely paintings from Akrotiri may not have even been preserved for us to admire today. But, as we can see from the more well-known Pompeii and the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, volcanic ash tends to preserve the things quite well when those things are buried in dozens of meters of the stuff. Akrotiri suffered a fate similar to Pompeii. Although the citizens of the Cycladic city must have known that the eruption was coming, because to date, no bodies have been found buried in the ash 
that sat over top of large parts of Akrotiri and other portions of Thera. Beyond the absence of remains so far in the archaeological excavations at Thera, archaeologists also know that there must have been some type of forewarning to the volcano's eruption, because they've found broken steps, collapsed walls, entire houses collapsed, and heaps of debris that were gathered by the absent inhabitants before they skipped town. Obviously then, before the town was buried in ash from the eruption of the volcano. We know then that the explosion had some precursory tremors or earthquakes associated with it. But I think the bigger question for us is when did the actual explosion occur? And from that, just how big was it? How did it affect not just Thera, but the entire Aegean and the Minoan influence there in particular? Well, as to the first question, there is a bit of disagreement still, but the dating of trees that were killed and preserved in ash, along with other dating methods like ice core analysis that has found evidence of the volcano's ejected material frozen in the layered ice of Greenland, all these forms of evidence lead to a generally accepted date somewhere in the mid-17th century BCE, that is, somewhere around 1650 to 1625 BCE. A specific date that's often affixed to the Thera eruption is 1628 BCE, and the frequency of that date in the research I've done, along with the more general dating to the same period, gives me some comfort in using 1628 as our date for the podcast here. So we have our relative date, which, if you recall, can't have been too far removed from the painting of the fleet fresco itself. The size of the theory eruption is, well, so large that we'd be completely on base if we just called it an explosion, as I've done a few times already. To get an idea of the force of the eruption, it's helpful to see a satellite view of the island itself, as the volcano's crater is actually at the center of the island. The island is formed, probably, from the accretions of volcanic eruptions over the millennia. The crater is submerged beneath the water at the center of the island, so Thera is essentially a ring-like island with a caldera in the center. Geologists tell us that prior to the Thera eruption, the magma from the volcano had gradually built up to the point that the island was basically a ring of land, complete, with only one entrance from the sea, the volcano crater in the center caldera of the island. Knowing this, and simply looking at an overhead view of the island today, can give us a general idea about just how powerful the explosion would have been, strong enough to completely annihilate a large chunk of the western side of the island ring. It's just not there today. Much of the remaining island was buried under thick layers of ash, layers that have been measured at up to 60 meters deep in some places. Now, I'm no scientist, so the explaining of how and why would be best left to them, but the recent studies I was able to find indicate that the Thera eruption was probably ten times as powerful as the famous 1883 eruption of Krakatoa. To maybe put this all in perspective, recent measurements have shown that the Thera eruption left 60 meters deep of ash at some places on the island, up to 80 meters deep in some places on the seafloor around the island. But the eruption spewed out ash in a circumference of at least 20 kilometers in all directions. That's just the direct ash and pumice. We'll talk more in a moment about the more widespread effects of the eruption. If we're talking sheer amount of ash that was belched forth from the Earth's core, geologists think that the Thera volcano released 60 cubic kilometers of ash from the Earth in comparison to Krakatoa's 25 cubic kilometers. The Vesuvius starts to look a little paltry at this point when I tell you that it only ejected six 
cubic kilometers of ash into the skies over Pompeii. Thera then ejected ten times the sheer volume of ash that Vesuvius did, which is just mind-blowing to think about. All right, I'll stop throwing out random numbers at you. I'm sure you get the fact that Thera was huge. And, well, just one more number, if you'll indulge me. The eruption measured in at 7 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index, a measurement system that only ranks them up to 8. So that gives you another idea. No more volcanic measurement terms now, I promise. After all, numbers like that are kind of meaningless without some type of reference point, so it would make more sense to look at just how the eruption affected the Aegean world and the Minoan civilization. The first, and perhaps most obvious, effect is that the violent eruption on Thera would have resulted in a tsunami that spread across the Aegean. Undoubtedly, it would have caused more damage to locations nearer the island. But so far, loads of evidence have been found on the northern shores of Crete, which lies 70 miles, or 110 kilometers, south of the island of Thera. This evidence indicates that a tsunami wave slammed Crete's shores in the same period that the Thera volcano erupted. Scientists estimate that the wave that slammed Crete's shores was at least 65 feet high, 20 meters, but that it was possibly much higher in some areas. For some comparison, they estimate that the resulting tsunami was equivalent in size and destructive power to the tsunami that occurred near Indonesia over Christmas of 2004. The Thera tsunami would have annihilated the coastal towns and inhabitations along Crete's northern coast, a fact that becomes more significant when we consider the heavy reliance that the Minoans had on their sea trade and travel. The tsunami would probably have destroyed any and all ships in its path, including most, if not all, of the ships docked at Crete. The shipping towns and ports on any northern shore between Crete and Thera would have been leveled, not to mention any ship or sailor unlucky enough to have been on the sea at the time the wave rolled through. Comparatively, the carnage wrought by the Indonesia tsunami is well known to those of us old enough to remember it. It's now thought that the Indonesia tsunami was one of the deadliest natural disasters in recorded history. And while the Minoan Aegean was not as heavily populated as Sumatra was on that fateful day, I can't escape the thought that for the Minoan people, the Thera tsunami proved to be a natural disaster that not only killed many of them, but was likely the catalyst that began the decline of their entire civilization. Not only did the eruption and the ensuing tsunami say that one five times fast if you can, I know I couldn't, but not only did they directly destroy a fair portion of Minoan ships, port towns, and other holdings, but the lingering results also left their footprint. The pumice and ash ejected into the air and up into the atmosphere would have darkened the sky for an area of at least 300,000 square kilometers. Pumice deposits identifiable to the Thera eruption have been found predominantly to the east and northeast of Thera, but reaching as far away as the Black Sea. At one time, similar pumice was connected to Bronze Age discoveries in the Nile Delta, although some now question the accuracy of those connections. Either way, the reach of the Thera eruption was great, and its effect was devastating. The last effect that I think needs mentioning is one that segues us into our final discussion for today's episode. Scientists think that this phenomena from modern volcanic eruptions would have also happened with the Thera eruption. That is, it would have left a huge mass of pumice floating on the surface of the Aegean Sea for weeks afterward, hindering shipping and trade. 
I think we all can get on board with the basic notion that pumice floats in water. But it's more helpful to know that connected pumice deposits, traceable to the Thera eruption, have been found on the shores of most of the Aegean islands surrounding Thera. Evidence that it floated there and was washed up on shore and buried over time. We'll close today with a few observations about how the eruption may have affected the long-term outlook for the Minoan people. But the floating pumice and the image of a far-reaching maritime civilization that was destroyed so violently rings a few bells in my ears. Does it in yours? Well, I'll just delve ahead even if you don't hear the tinkling of bells in your ears, but thanks for checking nonetheless. The cataclysmic results of the Thera eruption have been frequently tied with Plato's discussion of the lost city of Atlantis. Although the Minoan civilization is only one among the many and sometimes strange explanations that people come up with for the Atlantis myth. The legend has been an influence on utopian literature for several centuries, seen in works like Thomas More's Utopia and Francis Bacon's The New Atlantis. In more modern times, though, Atlantis has become the fodder of pseudo-history, beginning with Ignatius Donnelly's Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, and popping up in places as diverse, though weirdly connected, as the theosophical teachings of H.P. Blavatsky, which then bore some influence on the occult ideas that were incorporated into the more esoteric circles of the Nazi party. The American psychic Edgar Cayce also made Atlantean legends a focal point of his prophecy, but it's not been until more recently that the Minoan people began to be connected with Plato's Atlantis legend. Indeed, Minoan Crete couldn't have been connected with Atlantis before around 1900, because the existence of a Minoan civilization and its presence on Crete and elsewhere wasn't known before the discoveries made by Arthur Evans at the beginning of the 20th century. Since then, there have been those who've done their best to make a serious and academic connection between the Bronze Age Aegean and Atlantis, but the first thing I always think of is the early 90s DOS computer game, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, as it was probably among my first associations of Atlantis with the Minoan civilization. For the record, I did end up finding a copy of the Indiana Jones game online, and I may or may not have wasted a little time on it, time that I should have spent writing the end of this episode. So, apologies there. Maybe I'll make up for it by including a link to the game so that you all can reminisce with me if you played it back in the day. Anyway, I read a recent book by Gavin Menzies called The Lost Empire of Atlantis to try and get somewhat of a grasp on the arguments made by those who seriously equate the Minoans with Atlantis. And to be honest, I was a bit disappointed with the book. The author essentially tries to connect many of the locales that we've talked about on the podcast so far, but he makes the claim that the Minoans conducted direct and persistent trade with the places like Lothal in the Indus Valley and Wadi Gawasis on Egypt's Red Sea coast. He talks about the Ulaburun shipwreck, a wreck off the Turkish coast that's been dated to around 1300 BCE, a wreck that's worth looking into, which we will do at some point in the next few episodes. But the book begins to lose me when it tries to connect Minoan trade with India in the Far East, and then to say that naval bases in Spain and Portugal allowed the Minoans to sail to America, even into the Great Lakes, and introduce copper mining ideas and tools to the Native Americans. I suppose that it's theoretically possible, but it's a very far stretch, even if archaeological evidence has shown that Minoan trade did reach to Spain to some extent, 
whether directly or indirectly. Anyway, he also throws in Stonehenge for good measure, so be forewarned if this book is currently on your reading list or if it ever makes it on there somehow in the future. It's entertaining, I guess, but the probability of the theories that are proposed are pretty low, in my opinion. I go to the trouble of describing the book because it also tries to tie these theories about the Minoans to the legendary empire of Atlantis, as the title suggests, doing so mainly through a discussion of Plato's dialogues concerning Atlantis. I'll leave you to the Menzies book at your own discretion, but right now we're going to look at Plato's treatment of the legend. He is actually the only serious writer to have written about Atlantis in something that I guess is considered the historical record. It's amazing then to think that only two of Plato's dialogues have somehow snowballed into what's almost a pseudo-history industry all to itself surrounding the legend of Atlantis. The two dialogues in question, written by Plato, are Timius and Critias. Being dialogues, they're framed as conversations between various characters, all of whom, save Timius, were actual people from Greek history. Timius the dialogue is the first one out of the two to mention Atlantis, so the relevant passage is worth reading. Just let me give a brief background real quick first. The supposed conversation in Timaeus is set by Plato as taking place one day after Socrates described his view of what an ideal state is, a well-known passage that's contained in Plato's famous work, The Republic. At the outset of Timaeus, then, Socrates feels that his description of the ideal state wasn't sufficient for the purposes of entertainment and that he wants to hear a story of an example of an ideal state, as he described it, engaging in relations with a different state. A participant in the conversation, Hermocrates, wishes to oblige Socrates, and he says that his friend Critias knows just the account to do so. Critias then proceeds to tell the story of Solon's journey to Egypt where Solon supposedly heard the story of Atlantis, including how Athens used to be a virtuous state that was forced to wage war against Atlantis. Critias, however, feels that he's getting ahead of himself, and he asks that Timaeus tell part of the account from the origin of the universe until the advent of man, I guess to put some context behind the Atlantis-Athens story. The specific details about Atlantis are thus postponed. They're later included in the dialogue named after Critias. But the following excerpt from Timaeus is the first time that Atlantis is named in the historical record. Plato gives an overview of the Atlantis legend by putting these following words in the mouth of Critias. For it is related in our records how once upon a time your state stayed the course of a mighty host, which, starting from a distant point in the Atlantic Ocean, was insolently advancing to attack the whole of Europe and Asia to boot. For the ocean there was at that time navigable. For in front of the mouth, which you Greeks call, as you say, the Pillars of Heracles, there lay an island which was larger than Libya and Asia together and it was possible for the travelers of that time to cross from it to the other islands, and from the islands to the whole of the continent over against them which encompasses that veritable ocean. For all that we have here, lying within the mouth of which we speak, is evidently a haven having a narrow entrance, but that yonder is a real ocean, and the land surrounding it may most rightly be called, in the fullest and truest sense, a continent. Now, in this island of Atlantis, there existed a confederation of kings, of great and marvelous power, which held sway over all the island, and over many other islands also, and parts of the continent, and moreover, of the lands here within the straits, 
They ruled over Libya as far as Egypt and over Europe as far as Tuscany. So this host, being all gathered together, made an attempt one time to enslave by one single onslaught both your country and ours and the whole of the territory within the straits. And then it was, Solon, that the manhood of your state showed itself conspicuous for valor and might in the sight of all the world. For it stood preeminent above all in gallantry and all warlike arts, and acting partly as leader of the Greeks, and partly standing alone by itself, when deserted by all others, after encountering the deadliest perils, it defeated the invaders and reared a trophy, whereby it saved from slavery such as were not as yet enslaved. And all the rest of us who dwell within the bounds of Heracles, it ungrudgingly set free. But at a later time there occurred portentous earthquakes and floods, and one grievous day and night befell them, when the whole body of your warriors was swallowed up by the earth, and the island of Atlantis, in like manner, was swallowed up by the sea and vanished. Wherefore also the ocean at that spot has now become impassable and unsearchable, being blocked up by the shoal mud which the island created as it settled down. You have now heard, Socrates, in brief outline, the account given by the elder Critias of what he heard from Solon. Interesting stuff that, if a bit verbose. Now, the very last line there is the one that I was referring to when I asked if the pumice floating on the surface of the sea rang any bells in your mind. The people who make the Minoan Atlantis connection say that Plato's description of the impassable ocean after Atlantis's vanishing act could be explained by the pumice that would have clogged the Aegean after the Thera eruption. I'll go ahead and tip my hand here by saying that this association is pretty dubious. On top of that, almost every other detail that Plato shared about Atlantis doesn't line up with the Minoan civilization as we understand it. I suppose that the pumice rafts from the volcano would have hindered Minoan shipping for a while. Some people think that they were up to three feet thick and sat there for weeks. But Plato also says that the entire island sank into the ocean. Thera and Crete are still there and they haven't found any evidence of entire islands sitting beneath the waves of the Aegean, so we can't take Plato literally. For what it's worth, I don't think that we should take him literally either. His dialogues weren't intended to be histories, but for some reason, Atlantis sympathizers read Plato's dialogues as historical fact. I don't want to get too bogged down in it, but just from the synopsis above, we can see that Timaeus was connected by Plato to the discussion of the Republic. So, in that sense, they both were meant to function as theoretical examinations of the qualities that inhere in the ideal state or government. It's in that context that Critias tells his story about Atlantis, not in a context that claims to be true or even historically accurate to any degree. For me, though, the number of details recited in Critias, the dialogue, are what make the Minoan-Atlantis connection the most questionable. One scholar counted the number of specific details relayed about Atlantis at 53. All of those details, except one, two, maybe three, at the most if we're generous, None of the rest of them match up with the Minoan civilization, and Crete specifically. Yes, Plato describes Atlantis as having large, ornate palaces, but this is about where the similarities end. He places the Atlantean island beyond the Pillars of Heracles, which was the Greek's term for the Straits of Gibraltar. So, supposedly, Atlantis was in the Atlantic Ocean somewhere location is an issue. The time frame is also an issue because Plato places the destruction of Atlantis as having happened 9,000 years before his own life, 
a vast difference from the time frame of the Theron Cataclysm. The island itself is another issue. Plato describes a huge island formed with concentric walled rings connected by bridges. Thera may bear some resemblance to this ring-like layout, especially before the volcano's eruption, but Crete is nowhere near to hitting the description. Plato describes Atlantis as containing elephants, and none of the Aegean islands that I've ever been aware of can lay claim to resident elephant populations. In sum, only two or three of the details that Plato ascribes to Atlantis can be matched to the Minoan civilization, whether we're talking about Thera or Crete or both of them put together. Then, we have the fact that the stories of Atlantis in Plato's dialogues were told as moral tales in relation to the question of what qualities comprise an exemplary state. Perhaps the predominant point that needs making here is that Plato directly connected Athens with Atlantis. The dialogues were never meant to be accurate recitals of historical events. They were philosophical discussions meant to inform the issues of the day in Greece during Plato's lifetime. Hence the kind depiction of Athens in comparison to Atlantis. The Atlantis legend was conveyed for its moral instruction, the idea that Atlantis was once powerful because of its virtue, but fell prey to greed and was then defeated by the valiant Greeks, then finished off by the gods who desired to destroy Atlantis as punishment for its corruption. That's the position that my logical brain takes when it comes to Atlantis as a historical place. There is still a part of me that's always been fascinated by the legend, the possibility, however irrational it might be. My hopeful side takes the view that Plato couldn't have just made up the entire legend of Atlantis from whole cloth. Could he? Maybe he told the tale for its moral value, sure, and maybe he exaggerated, as was the Greek tradition, at storytelling gatherings like the one that was described in the dialogues. But maybe, just maybe, there was a seed of truth beneath all the hyperbole. That's what I want to believe, anyway. The truth is out there, right? I don't know. At the end of the day, I suppose it's possible that a volcanic eruption with effects as widespread as those of the Thera eruption would have left a large mark on the oral histories of the people around the Mediterranean. The Minoans wrote in their Linear A script, but as we've not managed to decipher it yet, we don't know whether the answers lie in an untranslated Minoan text somewhere out there. Even so, the oral histories that came down to Plato's day when the written word was finally picking up steam in Greece and around the world, could have transformed the destruction wrought at Thera upon the once mighty Minoans into a morality tale with relevance to the contemporary issues. The eruption was over 1,000 years removed from Plato's day, after all. Even today, we don't have a complete picture of life around 1000 AD, but imagine what our picture would be if there were no written records to inform that picture. It might be a bit different, or so I would imagine. Even though I don't think, personally, that there's enough historical basis behind the Atlantis legend to believe that it's true at all, but especially that it's true as applied to the Minoan civilization, I still want to leave you with a thought from a historian who I've been reading a lot of lately, Fernand Braudel, the historian who informed our discussion last time. He writes, Atlantis, according to the account of the Egyptian temple archives, for so was the supposed origin of Solon and Critias's story, was situated far to the west, at the limit of the known world. Plato, therefore, naturally placed it beyond the Straits of Gibraltar, in the middle of the ocean. But for the Egyptians of the 18th dynasty, the western limit of the known world would have been Crete. So, was the destruction of Atlantis 
possibly a combination of two events, telescoped together in traditional folklore. The end of the Minoan ascendancy and the eruption of Thera? That's what we're left with, ultimately, on this topic. A question mark. Braudel's question gives us a decent springboard for our discussion next time. That is, the topics of the Minoan decline and the rise of the Mycenaeans. Mycenae had been around for a slight bit before the Thera eruption, though not in any major way. They were minor players content to gather their strength. The Thera eruption didn't destroy Minoan hegemony immediately, but it seems to have set them on a downward trajectory. The Mycenaeans were all too happy to take advantage of that downfall and fill the shoes that would later be left empty by the Minoans. However, this transition from Minoan to Mycenaean brings us closer yet to the end of the Bronze Age, and hopefully, after tying up some loose ends and filling in a few gaps, we'll soon be moving on to that period. That's my material for today, and I really appreciate you sticking around to the end. I'm sorry if it was a bit tedious or long-winded this time around. Don't forget about our book giveaway. Entry closes on July 18th, so be sure to get your name in the hat while you still can. I did also want to let you all know that I'll be taking the next month off from research and writing, as I have only that month left to prepare for the bar exam. If I surprise myself and find time in there to prepare another episode, you will all be the first to hear about it. However, I'd appreciate your understanding if it does end up being a few weeks before we get back into the discussion. Thanks so much, and I look forward to that next discussion. Until then, take care, and thanks for listening to the Maritime History Podcast.